works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout, throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior your God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think of God, his Son not sparing, Sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. How on the cross my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died. Oh, to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation to take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. 
How many of you know that we would not have made it this far unless God was great? (laughs) We would not have made it here today or been through another week unless God allowed us to. How many of you know that you, your alarm clock did not wake you up this morning? It was God that said, breathe into you and rise and go into this day. How great God art, how great God is, how great God has been, how great God will be forevermore. How great thou art. Today we conclude our sermon series called Do the Right Thing. We have learned about the urgency of love. We have learned about the urgency of forgiveness. We have learned about the urgency of obedience. And today we learn about the urgency of faith. You know, in the movie Do the Right Thing, the 1989 movie by (laughs) that is set in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, New York, we remember that the mayor, the mayor tells anyone who will listen over and over again, his advice is always do the right thing. And, you know, some of us live into that and lean into that. We wake up, we show up, we follow the rules, and we do our best work. But everybody gets tired. And, you know, sometimes we have off days. And sometimes we need a reminder that in the midst of everything that is going on, we must do the right thing. We must wake up. We must show up. We must follow the rules, the Wesleyan rules to do good, to do no harm, and to practice staying in love with God. And no matter what, we always have to do our best work. You know, in school, if you wake up, you show up, you follow the rules, and you do your best work, you get a bumper sticker, and and it says honor student on it. And I'll tell you, when I was growing up, maybe my parents would have gotten one or two honor student bumper stickers, Elisa. And (laughs) um, they didn't like putting bumper stickers on their cars, so they went on the refrigerator. And every morning when you were getting breakfast, you were meeting, meted by these bumper stickers that said, my student, my child is an honor student at blank, blank, blank school. And do you know what that did? Every morning seeing that honor student bumper sticker, It reminded me of what I was supposed to do that day. It reminded me that no matter what, I had to get up, I had to wake up. That was hard for me. I had to show up to follow the rules and to always do my best work. It was like the bumper sticker set the expectation for the day. So today we learn about the urgency of faith in doing the right thing through the Old Testament book, Exodus. Exodus is near the beginning of the Bible. In fact, it is the second book of the Bible. And we're going to Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. You can read uh, on the screen or with your Bibles. We're going to Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. At the Lord's command... The whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin and moved from place to place. 
Eventually, they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So once more the people, so once more the people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us? Our children and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the people. What should I do with these people? They are ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join in. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock, and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Moses named the place Massa, which means test, and Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord here with us or not? Let us pray. Lord, here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say that you are our loving and glorious and gracious God, O oh God. We've come expecting a word from you. We've come expecting a word that strengthens our hearts and our minds and our souls. We've come expecting a word, oh God, that might irritate us a little bit and convict us a lot. Oh Lord, we've come expecting you to speak into our situations. We've come, oh Lord, expecting you to allow your Holy Spirit to flow freely. Have your way, O oh God, and speak through this your servant. Hide her behind that old rugged cross so that everything that is said and everything that is heard comes straight from you, O oh God. It is in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We encountered the Israelites this morning on a journey out of slavery and into the promised land. But the Israelites were a lot like church people. They had their idea of what they should be doing and which way they should be going. And they didn't really trust their leaders that what they said was true. And they didn't really trust their leaders to lead them into the promised land. The Israelites were complainers and grumblers. They said at one point that they would rather still be in slavery than wandering around the wilderness. We encountered the Israelites today coming out of the wilderness of sin. This is not to be um, put against the the. English word sin, but this relates to Sinai, an area in Sinai, and, and, <laughs> or Horeb, as the Hebrews called it. And you know, I can understand the request for water. You need water to live. 
In fact, Jesus said, I am the living water, right? You will thirst no more if you drink of this water. So you could understand how they would be thirsty in the wilderness and in the desert and how they would need and want water. They complained to Moses. Moses was a reluctant leader, remember? He was minding his own business when, <laughs> when a bush <laughs> just burst into flames one day and the Lord God said, take off your shoes for you were standing on holy ground. And, and Moses himself complained, Lord, I can't go back there. You remember, I'm a murderer. I killed somebody. Lord, I can't go back there. I have a stuttering issue. It's hard for me to speak. Lord, I can't go back there because because Pharaoh is crazy and he won't listen to me even though I grew up in his house he will not listen to me but Moses the reluctant Moses learned that you must follow the call of God on your life if you want any peace so he went and got the people and they complained and complained and complained and complained. Give us water. And, and Moses, like he didn't know that God would always provide. He, he said, Lord, wh where's the water? And, and, and this is uh, an interesting place to be because we learn in Exodus 15 and 16 and 17 that God has always provided for the Israelites. They knew that God was a provider. They had evidence of it when they needed to cross the Red Sea to get out of Egypt in Exodus 14 God made the water to split and they walked through on dry land and in Exodus 15 when the water was bitter and they could not drink it God made the water sweet so that they could consume the water and in Exodus 16 the people complained that they were hungry and God gave them manna from heaven and not just manna he gave them quail too but here we are in Exodus 17 after God provides over and over and over again after God proves God's nature to be loving and kind and generous they still don't get it Did you bring us out of Egypt so that we could die of thirst, Moses? Why are you complaining? Why are you testing the Lord? The Lord has already provided. Don't you think the Lord will continue to provide? But instead of responding in that way, Moses goes to the Lord and says, what should I do with these knuckleheads? They are ready to stone me. And the Lord being the one true God, he says to Moses, Yahweh says, walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one that you used when you turned the water of the Nile to blood and call some of the elders to join you, witnesses. <laughs> and I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. I will show up for you. Strike the rock and water will come gushing out then the people will be able to drink. Moses didn't respond by saying, are you sure? 
Moses didn't say, okay, God, I know that you made a way out of no way. One, two, three, for infinite times. I know that you have brought us thus far along the way. I know that you brought us out of slavery and out of Egypt. I know that you made us to walk across dry land at the Red Sea. And I know that you are leading us and guiding us. And I know, oh God, that you have given us water to drink before and I know oh God that you have provided food for us before and I know oh God that you have kept us safe and you allow us to win when we come against an enemy oh God I know you've done all these things before but are you sure you can do this that's not what Moses said Moses' response was to gather up the elders, to go to the rock where God said that God would meet them, and to take the staff that provided the plagues that got them out of Egypt and, and the staff that allowed them to escape from Egypt with their lives. He, he took that staff and, and he hit a rock, not just any rock, but the one that God said to hit. And all of a sudden, God made good on God's word and water came gushing out and there was more than enough for the people to drink and they drank and their children drank and their livestock drank. And again, 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 God had promised and God had kept God's promise. And they were no longer thirsty. And yet, the people still wanted to know, is the Lord with us or not? Is the Lord present or not? Is the Lord working or not? Is the Lord healing or not? Is the Lord protecting or not? Is the Lord making a way out of no way or not? Is the Lord the bomb in Gilead or not? Is the Lord healing or not? Is the Lord keeping or not? Is the Lord birthing new life or not? Is the Lord healing coronavirus or not? Is the Lord in the midst of the political unrest in our nation or not? Is the Lord in the midst of racism and hatred or not? Lord, are you here? For so many Christians, the, the question remains relevant through all of these years. We know the nature of God. We have seen the hand of God at work in our lives. And still, when things aren't going the way that we want them to go, when God is not a genie in the bottle and granting every wish that we want to be granted, still we wonder, is God here? Is God with us? Does God love me? Has God left me? You know, when that bumper sticker reminded me who I am, whose I am, and that I woke up and I showed up, I followed the rules, and I did my best work last semester, it was also a reminder that again I could wake up. <laughs> 
Again, we can show up. Again, we can follow the rules. Again, we can do our best work. We can love people the way that God intends for them to be loved. We can forgive those who wear us out. We can be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit because we've done it before. God was in it that time and God is still in our midst doing the work you know in order to do our best work we must seek understanding you can't do your best work and ace the test if you don't understand the material so to do our best work we must seek understanding and and we must ask questions in order to seek understanding. And when we ask the questions, we must either accept or reject the answer. The question for the Israelites and the question for each of us today, is God among us? Moses was irritated because the children of Israel were testing God. They were complaining. Even though God had already done all the things before, they were complaining. It was as if they had amnesia about God the provider. It was as if they had amnesia that God had gotten them through cancer before. It was if they had amnesia that God had provided a meal when they had $5 in their checking account. It was if they had amnesia that God had been a lawyer in a courtroom. It is as if they had amnesia that God had always been with them, had been the leader, had brought them out of slavery, had brought them out of situations, had brought them out of abusive relationships, had brought them out of plagues, had brought them out of so many places, it was as if they had forgotten. But Moses had not forgotten. And he knew from his own life that the one who forgave a murderer, the one who made a stutterer to speak to King Pharaoh, the one who ran away to hide. He, he hadn't forgotten that God had brought them across dry land. He hadn't forgotten the night that the Israelites put the sheep blood across their doors. He hadn't forgotten that time that God turned the Nile into blood. He hadn't forgotten the time that God set snakes and frogs and locusts to change Pharaoh's hardened heart. He hadn't forgotten that God had turn bitter water into sweet water. That God had fed the hungry people. And that God always, always answers. Who's the Moses in your life? Who can remind you about who God is when you wonder if God is present or not? 
Who's the one who holds you accountable for waking up and showing up and following the rules and doing your best work? Who's the one that reminds you of the urgency of love? Not, not love when it's comfortable, but love of all of God's children. Who reminds you that forgiveness is possible when you're so angry you can't stand the sight of them? Who's the one that reminds you that obedience is so urgent that if you want to have this abundant life that God has promised us, you have to follow God, follow God's leading even into the wilderness? You see, it was Moses' faith. It was Moses' belief and trust in God. It was Moses' faith that understood the urgency of the parched people. It was Moses' faith that didn't scratch his head and wander around and think, hmm, where am I going to get water from? <laughs> It was Moses' faith that reminded him over and over and over again that not only was God among us, but God was ahead of us, and God was behind us, and God was on every side, and God was providing and moving things out of the way, and God was protecting, and God was making sure our backs were covered, and God, it was God the whole time. It, it wasn't Moses, it wasn't Aaron, it wasn't it wasn't Pharaoh, it wasn't the president, it wasn't the governor, it wasn't the Supreme Court justices, it wasn't the mayor, it wasn't the preacher, it was God the whole time. Moses understood that when we are in crisis, it is our faith that reminds us that God is present with us. And if God is present with us, then God is working in us. And if God is working in us, then God is working through us. And if God is working through us, then God is working in the midst of us. And if God is working in the midst of us, then God is working on our behalf. Have, and we don't have to wonder if God is for us. We don't have to wonder if God is with us. It is our faith. Moses named the place Massa. Which means the people tested God here. And Meribah, which means that they argued about whether or not God was still God. <laughs> but through their arguing, through their complaining, through their testing. It was with urgency that Moses turned to God. And God told Moses what to do. And Moses didn't discuss it or second guess it. Moses just followed through because his faith, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, his faith reminded him that there is no question about whether God is with us or not. Faith is urgent. And it's only through faith that we can do the right thing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
We give thanks to God for you today. Thank you for worshiping with us. We give thanks to God for Ted and Chris and Elisa who have led us in worship and Wally and Carol and Stephen who have ensured that we might worship well together. Don't forget that Friends at the Front Door is next week. You can give your donation to provide for food and for toiletries for our underhouse neighbors. And don't forget about our concert first Sundays at first next week at 2 o'clock um, virtually uh, right here wherever you watch the worship service. We start a new series next Sunday called Interrupt. You will not want to miss anything in October. I promise you. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord give you abundant peace. May you share God's mercy, love, and grace with those around you. And may God show you how present God is in our lives. Now to the one who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the Most High God. Be all honor, glory, and praise now and forever. And the people of God sang. Let the church sing amen. Let the church sing.